Welcome, everyone. It's so good to see so many of you rolling in here. You're in the right spot. We are going to be talking about the James Webb Space Telescope tonight with our expert guest speaker, uh, Dr. Michael Rotowski. So just going to get everybody a few more moments to log in and get set, and then we'll get started. So welcome. If you have questions, start thinking about them, or if you uh, don't have any questions yet, if you do come up with them, we would love to hear from you throughout the night. So uh, questions are a great part of the evening, and you can think of them along the way, and I'll give you instructions in just a moment of how to ask our expert questions. Okay, but as we get into this, as more people are joining us, I would like to introduce myself. I am Sarah Devine. I am here. I'm the Pl Planetarium Programs Coordinator here at the Bell Museum in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, and as a museum, uh, we aim to advance our collective understanding of both the earth and sky. And as part of that, I would like to acknowledge that the Bell Museum sits on the traditional and treaty land of the Dakota people. I would also like to acknowledge the Ojibwe people, traditional keepers of the lands to our north. Dakota and Ojibwe knowledge systems are a crucial way of knowing this place now called Minnesota. And we honor that uh, knowledge here at the Bell the values embedded in it, and the people who keep it. If you do have questions throughout the night, they are our favorite part of the night. Please use the Q&A feature box here in Zoom to send in your questions and comments throughout the evening. Um, we'll be answering as many questions live as we can, and we have some staff behind the scenes to help monitor those questions and answer any of them that we can't get to live. We're gonna to try to get to as many as possible. This event is live captioned, if you find those captions distracting or not useful, you can hide them by clicking on the live CC button on your screen. And this program is also being recorded and will be posted to the Bell Museum's website and YouTube channels um, shortly after the event ends. Uh, so I would like to introduce our guest expert tonight, uh, Dr. Michael Rotowski. Um, Michael is currently an assistant professor at the physics and astronomy department at the Minnesota State University, Mankato. And he arrived there following his postdoctoral appointment at Stockholm University. And prior to that, he was actually here at the University of Minnesota completing his PhD um, at Univ uh, Arizona State University. Excuse me, I might have uh, mixed that up. So he has, he's the alum of both the University of Minnesota and Arizona State University. Uh, his primary research efforts are focused in the evolution of low mass galaxies in the very distant universe when they were actively forming stars and in the late stages of star formation um, where it has ceased by studying both the broadband colors and spectra of those galaxies. In his work, he uses telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope, GALAX and Astrosat. And on the ground, he uses a large binocular telescope as well. He is here tonight to talk to us about the James Webb Space Telescope, as he's a member of the James Webb Space Telescope science team, and he has earned time on that telescope immediately after it completes its orbit check-in. So one of the first rounds of things that are going to be happening, um, he's going to be working on. And he looks forward to exploring the multitude of galaxies that James Webb will reveal in both the local and distant universe. So please help me welcome Dr. Michael Rotowski as we learn more about the James Webb Space Telescope. So welcome. Uh, we're gonna switch uh, screens over here. Uh, uh, Michael, what, what do you have um, for us tonight? All right. Thank you very much for that introduction. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to talk about James Webb Space Telescope. Um, First of all, I should uh, just, again, say thank you. I'm really glad that I saw 100 of you or so logging in. Um, I'm really excited. I'm going to try to cover a great amount of information in a very short period of time. But if I run long, I've asked the uh, moderators to cut me off so that we have time to answer your questions, because your questions are why I'm here. I can talk about this all day until my, I go blue in the face, but I want to hear what your questions are about JWST, what you might be able to do with this telescope even in the future. So they ask me, or I always start off with a quick rundown. We're gonna to try to cover how, do you want, how does one become an astrophysicist? We're gonna roughly quickly walk through how did JWST even come to be? 
how is JWST going to obtain data when it actually gets into space, which it's very, very close to doing? And then how are ast astronomers and astrophysicists around the world of all stripes going to benefit from this uh, fantastic new telescope that NASA and, and the European Space Agency are launching? So to become an astrophysicist, you can come from any, any walk of life to become an astrophysicist. I grew up in the middle of uh, sort of coastal Virginia and coastal Virginia uh, where we're far away from the distant city. I was able to grow up, or grow up with the, the stars above me. Um, and I can actually trace, make a direct line between becoming an astrophysicist and jellyfish. And I wanna outline what that looks like here for you very briefly. Here's the town that I grew up in, a small town called Urbana, just on the coast of the Rappahannock River. And there was a small creek here. I can't show you my mouse necessarily, but there's a small creek just to the south of town called the Urbana Creek. And I used to sneak out into that creek when I was a little, little boy and go swimming in the river in the middle of the night. And what was fantastic about that creek was inhabiting this creek were these objects called comb jellies. And I've yet to discover these here for myself in Minnesota. So they may be more warmer weather uh, animals, but what they are known for is they're of related to jellyfish, but unlike jellyfish, they don't have these horrible stingers. So when you swim with them, all they do is fluoresce, they light up. And so as I would swim with these in the middle of a dark night, in the middle of nowhere in rural Virginia, these objects, when I agitated them with my hands, would cause the, the water around me to light up. And when I was a kid, I used to light up the, the, the water around me and with the stars and the Milky Way above, I used to think this must be what an astronaut feels like. And so for the youngest age, I wanted to be an astronaut. Unfortunately, I found out that astronauts can only be so tall. And I was getting very close to that height. And I thought, I don't want to work for years and years and years to become an astronaut, grow in half an inch, and then not be able to fit into the shuttle. So I gave up on that dream. And the next thing that I looked at was the next word in the dictionary was astrophysicist. And that's how I got to where I am today. So I'm going to come back to sort of my story later. But now let's talk about James w JWST, or J the James Webb Space Telescope. JWST is NASA's next biggest mission. JWST is going to be launched into space, hence the James Webb Space Telescope. Now, there are many reasons why we go to space, but the two most important reasons are that space allows us an unparalleled view of the universe around us. The Earth's atmosphere blocks light from reaching the ground. No matter how big you build a telescope, you cannot observe X-ray or ultraviolet or infrared or some, even some radio light on the ground. That is shown here in this image, this figure, the transparency of the atmosphere is plotted on the vertical axis from zero to 100. At 100%, the atmosphere absorbs all the radiation from space from reaching the ground. And you'll notice in sort of the optical or the, what's called the optical window or the visible uh, portion of this spectrum, you'll notice that the, at the atmosphere is perfectly transparent. All the light can reach us. But once you go to longer, lower energy radiation or lower energy light, you start to get the atmosphere obscured again, and then it becomes completely opaque again at, in the, what we call the far infrared. So to get above this, uh, beyond, beyond this effect, you go to space. Another reason you go to space is because this atmosphere is constantly moving. And what this means is that as the atmosphere moves, when you try to look at a star from the ground, the light from that star is being refracted or bent and moved and shifted in position with respect to your telescope over time. And so this means that the stars jitter. This is the reason why when you look at a star in the night sky, it appears to twinkle. What's happening is that some of the light is being redistributed to other positions on the sky and your eyes can't receive it. So JWST going to space will get above, above the atmosphere and beyond both of these effects. Now, why is NASA and the European Space Agency launching it? The reason is because NASA has a long and proud tradition of launching great observatories into space. These here pictured are three of the four quote, quote unquote great observatories, the Hubble Space Telescope operating in the optical and ultraviolet, the Chandra Telescope, which images X-rays, and Spitzer Space Telescope, which is no longer in operation, but this telescope observed in the infrared. So it was a natural conclusion as scientific demands and as the interests of the uh, astronomers developed based on the information that these telescopes were providing that NASA uh, determined that the James Webb Space Telescope or a next generation infrared telescope was what it should be working on. And so for years, literally decades, 
NASA has been trying to pull together this telescope and will launch it very, very soon. Now, what does this telescope look like? First of all, it's huge. This is the largest spacecraft that, our largest space telescope that NASA has ever launched. The mirror itself in the central image, that big gold uh, uh, mirror um, is six and a half meters across, 6.6 .6 meters across from side to side. So that's about 20 or so feet across. The whole telescope, as you can see in the bottom right hand image, is about the size of a tennis court. Um, the, you often see photographs of this telescope on the ground, as you see in the top right corner where it's folded up. The reason we had to make it like an origami paper swan was because we simply didn't have a spacecraft big enough to launch this telescope. So it has to fold up into a five meter wide uh, fairing or the top of the, the, the payload of a, uh, of a rocket that the Europeans are supplying for us. Uh, the telescope has four major cameras on board. It has two, what we call spectrographs, which I'll explain in a second. These are the near spec and the near is uh, um, devices. There's also the near cam and the MIRI devices. This telescope operates almost exclusively at wavelengths that are redder than what your eyes can observe. So this is uh, radiation that you sense as heat, but it will detect that light directly and image it. Now, two of these, tele two of these instruments, the near spec and the near is, don't only take images of the sky, photographs like you might even take with your cell phone in the infrared, but they also take spectra. So why is JWST putting so many spectrographs on this new telescope? Why aren't we just making pretty pictures? Well, the reason for that is because spectra encode a lot more information than a single image of an object. So in this diagram, you'll notice here's a star out in, out in space, a galaxy, in fact, the light from this object, when it passes through this instrument called a spectrograph, that light is refracted, it's bent, it's dispersed, and you produce this rainbow of color on your detector, on your camera. Now, if, you're, if you look carefully, you may notice that in this image, there are these horizontal black bars. Those horizontal black bars are region where, regions in the spectrum of this object where no light comes out, where the, no light is emitted. This black feature, these dark features, are essentially the fingerprints of the materials that are found within this host, in this case, a galaxy. And by studying spectra, we not only can see what the galaxy looks like, how, what's its shape, how bright is it, but also what it's composed of. We can find a lot more information out about what, it's ac what actually is going on in that system, not just um, what it looks like. So Jay, so there's a question about that that okay. came in. I think we are at a good spot. Yep. Um, well, is the James Webb Space Telescope mirror a regular mirror, or is it a different type of mirror to collect all this IR light, this infrared light? So when you look in your mirror, great question. When you look in your mirror at home, usually there's some silver in front behind a piece of glass. They sprayed on silver onto a piece of aluminum or something, and then that silver has been polished down. And the light in the optical, which is what your visible light that your eyes can see, bounces off of that silver surface and then bounces back towards your eye and you can see your reflection. In the infrared, silver is not such a great reflector, but gold is. So each one of these mirrors is layered with a very, very fine, a couple microns thick, a millionth of a meter thick layer of gold atoms, which are much more reflective in the infrared. And in reality, it's something like I heard once that it's about it's about three wedding rings of gold per mirror. And there are 18 mirrors total making up that entire surface. So it looks like a lot of gold. It looks really shiny, but it's really not that much. A um, Couple families worth of wedding rings basically. Um, but we use gold on a beryllium um, background. Beryllium is the third light, fourth, excuse me, fourth lightest element on the periodic table. And beryllium is really good at maintaining its shape when it's in a really cold environment like the one in outer space. And so we make, a, we make a platform and we spray that platform with gold and those gold uh, reflective surfaces become our mirrors. Great question. So the way we can get at what is in the interior or what is going on in the galaxy or the star that we're interested um, from this spectrum is illustrated in these few, few diagrams. So on the left-hand side, I've shown the simplest atom. This is a hydrogen atom, one proton, positively charged particle in the nucleus, that bound, has bounded to it a negatively charged electron. Now this electron just uh, can, can bounce between different energy states. If it's excited, 
It can move up in energy state. If it's de-excited or it loses energy, it can fall back down. And these states occur at fixed energies. It's sort of like being in an elevator at, a, at an apartment building. You can press the elevator button to go to floor one, you can go to floor three, but you can't go to floor 1.6 unless your elevator is broken. If the laws of physics break down, all bets are off. But when physics operating as it should, when electrons move up and down, they move with only to fixed orbital uh, positions. In order to excite those electrons to bounce up, they have to gain some energy. That energy comes to them in the form of light. And so if you were to observe this whole system, a hydrogen atom exposed to white light, what you would see on the top in a two-dimensional spectrum, or the same spectrum from the previous slide, but now just rotated 90 degrees, what you would see is that certain wavelengths of light are not visible. These are the wavelengths that correspond to the trans energetic transitions that electrons are able to make. Similarly, if you compress that two-dimensional spectrum down, if you just collapse it into one dimension, you get a 1D spectrum, like the one plotted at the bottom, which shows that the peak of the spectrum is somewhere in the sort of 500 nanometer or what your eyes see as yellow light. But then there are these absorption features, these little dips, these little troughs where light has been absorbed by the atom because electrons wanna use that information to excite upwards. Now, the opposite of ex excitement is de-excitement. So when the electron reaches its high, highest or its or, uh, orbital new orbital configuration, it doesn't necessarily wanna stay there. It prefers to be on the ground, just like an apple will fall to the ground. Electrons will fall down to the ground state. And when it does so, we have to conserve that energy. So out comes an emission spectrum. You see the inverse, so to speak, of the absorption spectrum. And what you can see here is the, the emission spectra for five different elements, hydrogen, helium, neon, sodium, and mercury. And you'll notice that each of these elements has a distinct number of lines and a distinct position of these lines in, in terms of their color that they produce. You cannot confuse neon with helium because there are lines that are produced by the helium atom due to these excitations or de-excitations that cannot be produced by the physics of the neon atom and vice versa. And so by looking at the spectra of element, a spectra of sources in the distant universe, we can figure out what they're comprised of. Now, even more exciting is in the infrared, we also know that each molecule has a unique spectrum. So here is an absorption spectrum. Think of this like the transparency spectrum that I showed you before for the atmosphere about why we went to space in the first place. And you can see the top, the three rows starting at the top are oxygen two, diatomic oxygen, two oxygen atoms bound together, and O3, or what we call ozone. Black is high absorption. Um, colored regions indicate regions of low absorption. O2 and O3 tend to absorb a lot of what we would call ultraviolet light, bluer than what you can see here in the rainbow of visible light that you're familiar with. It also absor absorbs a lot of radiation in particular uh, wide bands instead of narrow energies, narrow colors, wide bands at longer wavelengths, wavelengths in which the JWST is gonna operate. CO2 has a similar feature. CO2 absorbs very strongly if you look at the horizontal axis, you see wavelengths of two or three or four microns. You can determine, for example, in the atmosphere of a planet, based on what light is removed by the atmosphere, what elements or what compounds are in that atmosphere. So if you want to go look for life, you want to look for CO2, which animal life organisms exhaust as a result of bio, biosynthesis or the production of, uh, or the, the, the goings on of, of biological processes. It will produce CO2 that could be populated in the atmosphere. And you could see that even though you sit here in, in orbit around the sun, you could see that in distance uh, planets around other stars. So the reason for this, the reason why we have such, such bands is because molecules can move in different ways. Here I'm showing an animation of a carbon dioxide molecule. You've got a carbon in the center, two oxygens on the end. I'll play, I don't know if I can play it again on repeat. You can have the carbon oxygen wiggling in certain ways. You can have bending, what we call modes. And there's lots of different ways to put energy into these bending or vibrations or rotations. And that's why instead of getting individual color lines, you get broad absorption lines or broad emission lines in these, uh, in these uh, molecules. Now these appear primarily in the infrared. And so JWST wants to go after these. Now, where's JWST right now? Well, as of Monday, it was on this boat. This boat has arrived at French Guiana on the northeast coast of, of, of South America. 
and it contains the entire telescope. The entire telescope is in storage on this boat, was taken off the boat, and is now making its way across the country of French Guiana to its launch pad at Kourou. Kourou is where Europe, the European Space Agency launches its satellites. We are not launching the satellite in the United States. You might have heard of Cape Canaveral, for example, or in, um, now we have spaceports in New Mexico where Jeff Bezos or where uh, Elon Musk launches or Jeff Bezos launches from Texas. We're actually launching this from Europe because the European, one of the European contributions to this mission, mission was a giant rocket called the Ariane 5, which is able to carry such a massive spacecraft the distance that it needs to, be, to, to go to do its science. Now, when it launches, which is NASA has released, it will launch on December 18th, 2021 from Kourou. This is contingent, of course, on weather. There may be a late hurricane. Um, something can always happen, but the telescope will be there. It'll be ready to launch December 18th. And this has got everyone very excited in the community. Now, when it launches, I'm gonna show you a video. It's about two minutes long. It was produced by ESA, so some of the, the um, the verbiage is in French, um, but I'll show. I'll let you see what the telescope will do as it makes its way out to the place where it will start doing science, about a million miles from Earth, roughly. So I'm going to be quiet while this uh, plays. Six, Allumage de PAP, décollage. Okay, so I'll uh, pause the movie there and pick up. Um, so what you saw there in the last roughly 50 seconds of that film, the telescope will, the payload fairing will be released when the telescope is just, just after the telescope has left the atmosphere. As soon as it gets into space, it starts to unfold itself. The process that you saw in the last 50 seconds or so, that's about a full month's worth of work. When you saw the unfolding of what I'll tell you is the sun shields later, these things that are blocking the sun's heat from warming up the telescope itself, that process is not happening nearly as fast as uh, is shown in the video. The reason for that is because we definitely do not wanna screw something up. We don't wanna tear this very, very thin fabric 
that's keeping the telescope nice and cold in the depths of space. Otherwise, the telescope will be, uh, it will be very difficult to achieve the sensitivity to the distance objects that we're trying to get. So this process that was shown in the video, the second half, is taking place from the surface of the Earth out to about 12 times, excuse me, two times the distance from the, um, of the Earth from the moon. So it's traveling out about 900,000 kilometers. Um, and as it's going, it's preparing itself to eventually do science when it gets to its final destination. Now, where is its final destination? That destination is a place called the Lagrange two point. The Lagrange two point is this nice place in space where the gravitational pull of the earth, moon and sun balances out with the centrifugal force of the orbit of an object. And so Webb will make a halo type object, a ring like object around this point. And what this allows us to do is to maintain it in place in a, a particular position without having to do much work because the forces pulling on it will be equal out. So it kind of holds it in place um, during the lifetime of, of Webb. So what's it doing when it's in place? Well, one side will always be facing towards the sun. The sun facing side pictured on the right is where all the business end of the electronics for transmitting information back. The solar panels obviously are there. And the sun facing side is the side where light from the sun will be absorbed and then radiated away through this sort of radiator foil that you see on the left side, the observing side. All of the scientific instruments, which have to be kept very, very cold, and the telescope itself, the mirrors, have to be kept very, very cold in order to reduce the noise, those side, that part of the telescope will always be facing away from the sun. To give you another sense of what that looks like, here's JWST on the left-hand side. JWST will always see approximately about 45% of the sky with its bottom always pointed towards the sun. It can wiggle a little bit. It can go about five degrees in a roll angle from there, but it can't go much more because then the sunlight begins to scatter onto the telescope itself. And the sun is so bright. The earth is so bright. The moon, in fact, is so bright that we can't, be, we can't uh, allow our, our telescope to, be, um, uh, to, uh, to observe those objects or it'll, it'll, it won't burn the detectors, but it makes it very difficult um, to recover from. What JWST, oh, sorry, another question. Uh, sorry, there was a question uh, yep. kind of about the mechanics of, of Hubble, or excuse me, of a web out here. Um, does the telescope have any thrusters which can be remotely controlled from Earth? It does have some, I know that during, it, it, it does a number of course corrections on the way out um, where it, uh, attitude corrections. So there are thrusters on board. I'm not terribly certain that there are gonna be, there. periodically it will need to, to, um, to correct itself. Um, so periodically there may be thrusters that are applied, but in general, you really don't want to because whatever you're using to provide thrust, it's all a conservation of momentum. So you're kicking out a lot of debris, a lot of gas, and that gas might end up falling back on your telescope as you orbit back around, and that could be disastrous. So if there are thrusters being used at the position, which I assume there would be, they're not going to be used very frequently. There are thrusters that are being used as it opens up and unfurls itself as it makes its way out to L2 though, for sure. And another related thing about its location out here in space is that Hubble needed to be repaired in space, uh, but would that ever be possible here with Webb? Unfortunately, no. JWST is going out to this very cold part of space, which is too far for us to grab at this moment. Hubble was about 200 miles or so directly above us. It made an orbit every 90 minutes or so. If you launched from Cape Canaveral and you were going fast enough, you could catch it. And you could carry along astronauts, bring it into the shuttle bay and repair old cameras, take out old computers, fix it up as need be. And for 30 years, we were able to do that. We don't have the capability of putting astronauts out at this distance. Um, so unfortunately, when it gets out there, it's on its own. We will be able to do a lot of work remotely. A lot of this is software, but if things become jostled, um, if things become impacted by micrometeorites, which is unlikely, but always a possibility, um, those, could, those could harm the telescope in such a way. Now we incorporate redundancies. For example, we put multiple cameras on that do the same thing. The near cam, for example, is the same camera made twice. So if we lose a near cam, 
and it fails because of an electronic uh, board frying or something, we can you still use the other one. So we built in redundancies because we don't have the ability to access it with astronauts. Great question. We'd love to, um, but we can't. On the far on the right right side of this image, I also pointed out that all the instruments again, near cam, near is, near spic, miri, and these other two sensors called the fine guidance sensors, which control the pointing of the telescope on the sky. Um, multiple telescope, multiple instruments can be operated on this telescope at once. And what that means is that astronomers can work together. One, one astronomer may look at some galaxy and with another camera, another group of astronomers may look at another galaxy or another planet or something of interest. We can share the time um, between ourselves as big collaborations, which is really powerful. Um, and many, uh, Hubble had this capability as well, but this will be essential with JWST, which takes a long time once it's arrived at a new position to cool down, to orient itself and to start taking data. So the, uh, we try to be as efficient with our time as possible. So this is sort of like a chameleon. One eyeball can look on one way, one eyeball can look the other. Now, JWST is an international collaboration that each of these little hexagons indicates the position of a scientist who is associated with the science team or an instrument team. I work with many scientists, science teams. I've never constructed or built any of the instruments, um, but these science teams are spread across the globe mainly in Europe and, and the US because those are the, the two major funding agencies. There are uh, groups in Canada as well as Canada, the Canada Canadian Space Agency is a member partner. Getting back to my story, if you look at this map and you compare with where I've had to live for the past 15 years, oh, South Korea got shifted, I didn't live in China. China's not a member partner. But if you look at the map of green dots of where I lived, you probably recognize that many of these places are the same places where JWST teams reside. That's a bit by coincidence, but it's turned out to be very beneficial because it allows me to do new science with new people from the collaborations that I had over the past 15 years between the US, Europe, and Asia. Now, what is, it, what is it that I'm doing? In a word, or in four words, I've studied primarily young, massive, hot stars. Massive, many times the mass of the sun, five, 10, 50 times the mass of the sun, Hot means many times more uh, hotter than the sun. Our own sun is a paltry 5,000 Kelvin or about 5,000 degrees Celsius. These stars that I study are 10, 20, 30,000 Kelvin, five, six, 10 times hotter. And I've looked at two different topics and I wanna show you how these topics can be addressed with James Webb as well in the, in the very near future. First, I'm gonna discuss how we can use young hot stars as tracers of the merger histories of massive galaxies. Old, what we call red and dead, old retired galaxies that have a lot of mass and aren't doing terribly much interesting right now. We can also look at the role of young hot massive stars in ionizing the universe. So I tried to make this as simple as possible and I'm gonna move as quickly as possible so we can get more questions in. Here are two questions, or two, two galaxies. You have one galaxy on the left, which is a big round ball, maybe an orange M&M. &M. On the right, you have a big, beautiful spiral galaxy. How is it that two galaxies came to look so different? What dictates how a galaxy is gonna end up over at, from its birth to its death or its, its retirement, so to speak? What dictates that process? Well, this is a very complicated question. So I've been looking at one particular aspect of this. I've been looking at galaxies more or less like the ones on the left in here. These galaxies are very massive, maybe a thousand times more massive than our own Milky Way galaxy. They're very old. They contain mostly stars like our sun and they're, they're relatively boring. They're not really forming any young stars right now any new stars right now. They've done all the exciting stuff that they're gonna do long ago in their history, and we're just observing them now sort of in retirement. Now, when we observe these galaxies, we find an interesting trend. Now, here's a, the only plot that I'm gonna give you for the night, or the second, pl first plot I'm gonna give you for the night, which is the size of the galaxy plotted on the vertical axis, and the horizontal axis has the mass of the galaxy. So we're looking at how big the galaxy is in size versus how big it is in mass. And when we look at early galaxies that of, are of this massive retired sort, when we look at those galaxies, they seem to fall more or less along a line like this. 
That is galaxies, when we look at them, maybe 4 billion years or so after the Big Bang, we find them to all sort of lie along this line. Now, if we look at galaxies that are more close to us, so we're seeing them later in their lifetimes, we find a trend that looks something like this. If we look today, Big Bang plus 13.8 billion years, or today, what we find is that galaxies of these type are fundamentally larger for a fixed mass. They're bigger in size than they were when we observe them in the early history of the universe. Why is that? Is it the case that individual galaxies grow over time? That individual galaxies maybe gobble up mass around them, create new stars, puff up as a result, and grow bigger over time so that when we look at them in the past and then we look at galaxies like them in the present day, we find them to be different sizes? Or is it the case that maybe we're doing the survey wrong? Maybe the galaxies we see in the local universe were big to begin with, and they've just recently entered into retirement, so they look really boring now. We just didn't catch them at the right time. We can answer this question by looking for young stars, because as that fresh gas comes in to potentially grow galaxies, as galaxies gobble up little neighbors around them with fresh gas, they may periodically create new stars. And those new stars can be very bright in the ultraviolet. Their young, hot, and massive stars are very bright in the ultraviolet, bluer wavelengths than what we can detect with our own eyeballs. And so if we look for those, those, the presence of those stars, we can get a handle on why these galaxies grow. Another question I've looked at is the question of why hydrogen is ionized in the universe. So think back to the proton and electron I showed earlier. To ionize an atom means to kick that electron free. So for some reason, when we look around the universe today, around outside of our own Milky Way, all the hydrogen atoms are naked little protons and naked little electrons zipping around. And for some reason, when they recombine, they come back together and form a neutral hydrogen, there's enough light to rip them back apart again. That wasn't always the case. And this is probably the simplest diagram you'll ever see in a physics talk. But on the vertical axis here, I show you the fraction of ionized hydrogen from zero to 100%, 100% at the top, zero at the bottom. On the bottom axis, I show time. Zero is Big Bang to now on the right-hand side, at the right-hand right end. When we first formed hydrogen, we found it to be neutral. For some reason, it ionized very, very quickly in time. And now when we look around in local universe, we find it all to be ionized. Why? Well, the solution to that is a little bit more complicated but it's probably related to the development of the first stars in galaxies. Here's another history of the universe. This is a little bit more complex. The Big Bang is on the left-hand side. Today is on the right-hand side. The little dots that you see on the right-hand side, those are all galaxies that we can see today. As you move further and back in time, we start. We, there's some point in, in history in which there were no galaxies. There were no stars. Galaxies take time to form. That was something around 400 million years or so after the Big Bang. Presumably the theory or the working theory is that after this dark age, stars turned on, they started to pour out ultraviolet photons which ripped apart the electrons from their hydrogen protons. And that caused this reionization that we observe in the present day. Now the problem is that we can never directly detect this because all of the hydrogen between us and 400 million years after the Big Bang when we look that deep, all that hydrogen is neutral. Much of it is neutral. So it absorbs a lot of that radiation we're looking for. So it's hard to confirm that directly. So we have to do alternative searches where we try to find analogs locally and then uh, draw back analogies to uh, compare those galaxies we see around us and the output of ionizing radiation from those galaxies with what we could expect from the earliest galaxies in the universe. Now, this all happens, and this has happened for my lifetime, with four, primarily four telescopes. Young hot massive stars emit predominantly at UV in ultraviolet wavelengths, bluer than the eyes can see. And we use telescopes that, some of which exist, some of which are soon to exist, that operate in the ultraviolet in order to see this light. Now you're probably asking yourself, well, wait a second, you just said JWST is an infrared telescope. That's redder light than my eyes can see. That's lower energy. Why in the world is a UV astronomer doing JWST science? Well, the universe is in our favor, or in my favor in particular. So here's an image of, I'm gonna show a zoom in, of a region in our own Milky Way. So you're seeing an image from the ground of our Milky Way 
We're gonna zoom into the disk of the Milky Way galaxy, and we're gonna zoom in on a very popular region called the uh, um, uh, M16, the Eagle Nebula. And as we zoom in, what you'll see is that this pinkish region starts to reveal itself as a very complex area. This is an active region of star formation in, the, in our own Milky Way right now. Right now, there are bright blue stars, ultraviolet bright stars that are pouring out radiation and ionizing the gas around them to cause this like heavenly sort of glow that you can see. The dense dark material or the dark material that you see, these little protuberances, these little uh, antennae, if you wanna think of them that way, those are the densest regions of gas in this vicinity that are able to withstand the onslaught of this radiation ripping out, ripping apart hydrogen and carbon and oxygen atoms. Now, this is a Hubble image. This is a UV, ultraviolet plus visible, plus a little bit of infrared. With JWST, we can actually learn about what the young hot stars are doing, even if we don't look at them in the ultraviolet. Here's the visible from Hubble. Here's the near infrared. This is essentially what JWST will see. And what do you notice? You can start to peer through the dust. You can see into the densest regions. You can see where the stars are actually forming in these dense clouds right now and use that to constrain the impact of stars and uh, star formation on the local environment. You can also look at the dust. There's bright stars nearby that are warming up the dust and that dust is radiating away that light back to us. And in the infrared, this is our best image now, but imagine this mid-infrared image looking like one of the two on the left. That's what JWST will give us. Is it time? Uh, well, we do have plenty of questions coming in. I wanna kind of give some framework to this. Uh, you've been telling us a lot about the galaxies and the distant stars that you'll be studying. Um, can you, and you touched a little bit at the beginning about how are we looking for planet atmospheres. Could you touch on the other areas? I think there's four main science areas uh, JWST is gonna look for. And then we have two questions uh, about planets and how it's gonna work for planets. All right, let's just skip right on to the planet section. So let's zoom on forward, moving past. We can come back to it in the question session if you want. Let's look at what JWST is gonna do for planets. JWST, JWST will do a lot with regard to planets. First of all, it has this infrared spectrograph, which allows you to detect molecules. We find that things like comets here on the far left, this is the comet 67P, sometimes called the rubber ducky comet. The Europeans actually landed a mission called Rosetta on the surface of this comet. And when they did, they found very complex dust molecules. They found ice, so on and so forth. JWST will be able to look at comets throughout the solar system at great distances and look for the same material. So we can understand how does water come into the inner solar system? With other planets like Uranus and Neptune, these are ice giants. We can understand how does weather work on these, these distant objects? We haven't been to these planets for more than 30 years. We don't really understand how their weather works. JWST will give us that insight. Perhaps the most exciting thing is that JWST will be able to detect other planets around other stars directly. Here's an image of what that might look like. In the center, you have a star which has been blocked out. The light from that bright star is blocked out. And surrounding it, you can see three little dots and almost in a row. Those are hot, hot young planets. The planets are still condensing and as they are coalescing, and as they coalesce to a, co uh, a single uh, uh, object, they release heat. That heat can be detected directly by JWST. So we can start to ask questions about how unique or how common are the conditions for life around the Milky Way, not just in our own solar system, but for other planets of which there are many, many, many known. At present date, we have about 5,500 5, planets that are known. I'm gonna play this very quickly. Here is an image, that a movie that was produced by an astronomer who took all much of the data of the known planets around central stars and put them all on the same scale as our own solar system. They're color coded according to their temperatures and their, oh, sorry. They're color coded according to their temperatures and their um, sizes, the size of the dot corresponds to how big they are in relation to planets that we're familiar with. So if you pick any one of these objects, what you'll notice is first of all, most of these solar systems are much more compact. Many of these solar systems fit within the orbit of Earth or Mars or Venus even. Many of these solar systems contain very hot Jupiter-like planets, very hot Neptune-like planets in the vicinity of these stars. We have thousands of, of stars 
with thousands of planets in orbit around them to study with JWST to understand how common um, are um, uh, planets of different types, are planets of different mass, um, how are planets distributed? Do they look like our own solar system with rocky planets in, close into the sun and icy or gas giants far out? That may not be the case, but we still don't know. And JWST is going to help really nail down that question for us. Most importantly, I think, is the question you ask, which is about how do we detect the atmospheres of these planets? And this is some of the coolest, and I don't study this at all, but I can still happily admit that this is some of the coolest stuff that we'll do in, with JWST. This is a spectrum here, which is an absorption spectrum with absorption, high absorption, uh, uh, um, high absorption or absorption uh, increasing towards the top of this axis. So the wavelength range that we're showing the spectrum for is the wavelength range roughly over which JWST will operate. This is what the earth would look like if you were observing the earth pass in front of the sun around some other star. What JWST will be able to do is to look for the way in which light is absorbed as it passes through the very, very thin envelope that is the atmosphere of distant planets. And it will look for what features or what wavelengths of light are absorbed by that atmosphere. And remember, each molecule has its own unique spectral signature. So carbon dioxide will present itself in unique ways, water, methane, so on and so forth. And so we can look to characterize the atmospheres of other planets around other stars. And if you find evidence for varying methane, for example, methane is an ob a molecule which breaks down very quickly in the atmosphere. It only lasts for a couple months here in Earth, here on Earth's atmosphere. So if it stays constant over a long time, it could mean that there's a source of it on the surface, which could be natural. It could be ice melting on the surface, releasing methane to the atmosphere like it does in the ocean, or it could be life. And if you find ozone, if you find oxygen, if you find carbon dioxide altogether, you find the strongest evidence to date for potentially life bearing or life supporting planets around other stars. So this is technically the last slide. So I'll stop here. Um, it's 749 by my watch. So let's just hit up the questions. I see nine Q&A questions left yes. and we'll go back if anybody's interested in the other stuff. Yeah, so it's the JWC is going to be doing a lot of different things of early universe, galaxies, stars, and other worlds that you just hit on. Um, with all of this, though, can you give us an estimate of when the first light will be after it launches and deploys? And then when that first light does come in for scientific research, or when the first images come in for the scientific research, um, how, do, how does the time get allotted on the telescope? How did you get time on this telescope? Okay, two, two parts. The first is about six months or so. Um, we should start getting some of the first light data um, after, it, after it arrives in, at L2. So about eight months or so after launch, we should expect, so August of next year, or we should expect to see the first images. And when they come out, you'll be sure to see them because they'll be on the front pages of every newspaper probably or every website because they will be fantastic. Um, uh, we hope, unless we hope, <laughs> we cross our fingers. <laughs> um, let me not speak too quickly. Um, in terms of how do we determine what objects to look at, we've got the entire universe to observe. So how do you pick one object or one pointing? That is a very contentious process. Basically what NASA does is NASA allocates that selection process to the community. The community sits down in panels Panels focused on things that they have common interests in, for example, planetary science or high redshift galaxy, distant galaxies or extrasolar planets. And those um, um, panels will solicit proposals from the community. And you try to make your best case to those panels that you have the best place to look for whatever interesting science you wanna do. And then those proposals all are compiled together of which there are about six times as many or eight times as many that will, could ever be looked at because we just don't have enough time. Um, and those proposals are winnowed down into you know, the top proposals. And then those are all compiled together. And then what's called the Space Telescope Science Institute, which is based in, in Baltimore, they then ultimately decide how each hour of time from JWS, that JWST can observe um, science objects will be divvied up. And so there's a big announcement and either it's the greatest day of your life or it's the worst day of your life. 
And because then you have to wait again. If you lose, you have to wait again until next year. So we've had two, technically, we've only had one, but we've had two cycles of this uh, review. The first cycle was guaranteed to people who built equipment or were guaranteed in uh, time because they developed a science case for a given instrument. So I worked with the near cam science team to develop a science case. And we're gonna look at the North ecliptic pole, uh, which is always visible with JWST. We never have to wait until it comes into view. And we'll have some guaranteed time of some deep fields. We'll get data that looks very much like the top left image uh, on this diagram. And then I also work on another program, which is called Passage. And Passage is designed to do parallel science. So while one team was awarded time to look at one object, we get to turn on another instrument and look very, very deep and look for very, very distant galaxies. And in, specifically, we look for a few very strong emission lines associated with star formation. And all the science that I was talking about will be science I'll continue to do with that, with that data even though now I'll be doing it with an infrared telescope instead of in the ultraviolet or optical. Okay, uh, we have a few questions that come in a little bit more to the engineering side of the telescope here. How long did it take to build JWST? I think they started in 95. I had an image, 1995. So it started quite some time ago. I had an image, I took it out, but I don't know if anyone on this community, on this call, actually remembers what a slide is or a slide projector. But NASA actually used to distribute slides of public press, press releases. You know, instead of a photograph, they'd make a little a small slide. I found some slides yesterday that had potential designs for what was then called the Next Generation Space Telescope, um, later reframed as the James Webb Space Telescope. That process of actual construction began in the 90s but the debate about where what the telescope would do, what the telescope would look like, was started in probably, probably before I was even born. To be completely honest, I won't give away how old I am, but be probably in the in the 80s sometime. Um, I'll ch I'll check up the, out on that, and maybe we can post it later. But um, but it's been a long time. Uh, to get for reference, though, the Hubble Space Telescope was launched when I in 1995. Um, no, in 1990, it's about 30 years old now. Um, and it was launched in 1990. It was first hypothesized in the 1950s. It took 30 years for us to build it and to decide what cameras to put on it. So these telescopes, because they're so expensive and we only get one every few decades, these telescopes take a long time to build because we they need to work for a long time. I didn't mention how long it actually works. But JWST will operate for at least five years, hopefully for 10 years. So for 10 years, without any contact from human beings, it has to work perfectly. So we need to build it right. That's why it took so long to actually complete the, complete the whole assembly, because it had never been done before. And if we did it wrong, we might shoot ourselves in the foot for the next decade or more of astrophysics from space. Yeah, Hubble is now over 30 years old. So just think of all those wonderful uh, space pictures you've seen throughout the years, that was all Hubble. So one question that came in is, it's, it's been a long time in the work, in the works here, but it's also cost a lot of money. Uh, will it be worth it, do you think? Um, absolutely. Um, I, I, I very much say that, and not just because I'm a, a fan of JWST. I think the, 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 the astro astronomical community in general has said, um, this is gonna do a lot of stuff for a lot of people. And a lot of people are gonna have data to work on for decades to come because this data will come to us so quickly. So there will be PhDs who work on, a, on JWST data when JWST doesn't even exist anymore because there's gonna be so much data. That one program that I work on has almost 600 hours worth of data that it will obtain. Millions, tens of millions of spectra will be produced. There's no way in five years we'll be able to analyze those and mine that data for all of, the, all of the science that can be gained. There is a debate within the community because we've already started obviously thinking about the next generation telescope, a, success, a true successful successor to Hubble. The price tag on that is estimated to be at least, at least something on the order of 20 to $25 billion. And the NASA budget in one year is something on the order of, let's just say ballpark 18 to 20 billion. It varies and it, it, if you take into account how inflation works and whatnot. 
but 18 to 20 billion, that's a huge fraction of the budget spent over 20 years or so to construct such an instrument. There is a debate within the community, now that technology can be made a lot smaller and a lot more compact, should we be launching instead 100 little telescopes that each do a single thing instead of one giant telescope that has to do everything for everyone? Because what happens is when you try to do everything for everyone, no one's really ever that happy. So the community is probably going to see one more giant telescope after James Webb, but I bet in, by the time that I'm retiring, which is course of is, is hundreds of years from now, when I retire, I bet telescopes will be a lot smaller and there'll be a lot more of them and they'll be distributed in different places because of this debate. Um, but JWST will do planetary science. People who are studying Jupiter right now are really excited about Jupiter, I mean, about JWST. People who wanna know more because we haven't been there since the 80s to Uranus or Neptune, how they formed, how weather works on those surfaces, how does heat exchange, they're very excited about JWST because that's the only access they have. And in order to send a mission out to Uranus or Neptune, they'd have to spend a couple billion dollars themselves. And so, you know, $10 billion to do everything everyone wants or a billion dollars just for one small community within Astro or within the NASA uh, portfolio, you know, you've got to, you've got to make that, that balance. So. Okay. Well, we have about a minute and a half here left. So I, we have time for one last question. Um, if life is on another planet, because James Webb is going to study planets, both in our solar system and out, what do you think it will be the impact it has on Earth? Oh, this is a great question. I think it changes everything. Because right now, there's changes for two reasons. One is because um, humans, you know, it's, it's been said many ways more poetic, poetically, but it would be an awful waste of space if this entire universe is only filled by only us. It's, it's either, the, I think it was said that it was, it's the scariest proposition that the universe is filled with life, but they don't talk to us, or it's not filled with life at all. Either of those is a very scary idea. So if we find out where life is, that's great because it, it, it relieves us from the, the feeling of just utter cosmic loneliness. So that has philosophical implications and all the, all the rest. In a scientific sense, it would be fantastic because it would help to provide new insight to what exactly uh, happens or what exactly is necessary for life. Right now, we've only found life on one surface, the earth. But when we found life on the earth, it fills every niche in the environment. We find life everywhere. So it's been puzzling scientists for a long time, which is why does it seem so easy to develop life of such diversity here on earth and yet nowhere else seems to have that diversity or any life whatsoever? What, what is stopping that? Well, maybe the answer to that is not that there's anything wrong with the theory of biology or a theory of evolution or a theory of how life comes to exist in the first place, Maybe it's a lack of data. We just haven't been listening and looking long enough, so we haven't been able to find it, which is very reassuring scientifically because we've invested a lot of our, our time as a scientific community in trying to understand why life is the way it is, at least here on Earth. So, oh, I just lost folks. Oh, you're still here. Um, I just We are at the end of our time together tonight. So I want to let everybody know we're talking about James Webb some more tomorrow. Uh, I will be here tomorrow night, uh, as well as some of our other planetarium staff that you might have seen from other previous star parties, including Tad up on our roof deck with live telescopes, should the weather cooperate. But we'll talk more about James Webb, um, the science and engineering behind it tomorrow. Uh, we also have several links for you to have fun at home with James Webb, including fun pumpkin carving patterns. If you want to get into the, the Halloween spirit with Webb, uh, both Spider and James. And I want to thank you all here for joining us tonight. Astronomy programs are made possible by Ruth and John Huss and the generosity of donors like you. Uh, if you want to feel, if you feel like making a gift of any sort here to the Bell Museum to help us continue these projects, um, we greatly appreciate um, gifts large and small. But we are out of time. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I hope to see you all back here tomorrow night as we dive deeper yet into James Webb, the science and the engineering. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Joining us, Mike. Right. Thanks so much for the great questions.
I can stay on a little bit and answer these questions if people are still here, just very quickly. Does that, or do you want to shut this down? Uh, we, we could try to get through a few of these last questions if anybody else wants to stick around, yes. Um, okay, so one of them, let's see, uh, actuators on the telescope. Yep, it will. Um, are, is the telescope gonna have some actuators, some, something to help move the mirror? Every mirror is gonna be carefully repositioned at, at the beginning of every observation and during every observation. There's a little, little mechanical lift that's built into each mirror. So there are 18 little lifts. So yes, that's in, very important for achieving um, what we call collimation, being able to put, make a point source look like a, a nice round blob on our, our nice round point on our image. Um, yeah. Okay, um, so I think you mentioned it already uh, that you are gonna be looking kind of at the poles of, of the sky. Uh, where else are you gonna look for your research here using James Webb? Well, we'll look also wherever anyone else is looking because we have this parallel program that whenever they stare at, usually it's like a distant quasar and accreting supermassive black hole in a distant galaxy. They'll stare, for that, stare at that for a long time to try to see the host galaxy itself, maybe 10 hours, 20 hours. For those 20 hours, we're gonna be poking around nearby looking at just some deep field, looking for uh, distant galaxies in those fields and whatever else pops up. <laughs> um, we don't get so much of a selection on that. They just give us the data. Well, not for free, but almost for free. Uh, okay, so then into some more things that are gonna happen scientifically with the telescope. Uh, what do you think is the most important scientific objective of JWST? Um, and is it gonna be looking for water, hydrogen? Is that is that one of the, the more important things? Uh, for sure, within the within the planetary science community, that, that will be chief you will be, see lots of articles about Earth-like planets and the possibility for um, uh, uh, those planets supporting life. You know, rocky bodies with oceans is a really big deal. Um, those look a lot like the Earth and understanding where they form, what their atmospheres are comprised of. If we find complex molecules in those atmospheres, oh boy, you're gonna get some really great papers out of that on the existence of life. Um, back to the kind of engineering side of it, of how many mechanic mechanisms or deployments are needed after a launch? Um, and what's gonna happen if something doesn't work when James Webb is going out there? Oh boy, if something doesn't work, we could be in real trouble. I think the most, the most worrisome thing that could fail is the sun shield. But even if the sun shield fails, if some of the heat from the sun, the earth, the reflected heat from the earth, infrared from the earth, even if that makes its way to the detectors, the MIRI instrument may not operate properly, but the near-infrared can. And if you think about it, the near-infrared instruments that HST, Hubble Space Telescope has, those are operating 200 miles above the Earth. There's a lot of um, um, extra background light from in that environment at those wavelengths. Um, and so in, the, in JWST, if things go wrong, we can still accomplish a number of the primary miss mission goals um, the worst thing I think that could happen that is irreparable maybe is that the thing doesn't unfold at all. It just gets stuck as, um, you know, the wrapping paper um, set up. And that would, be, that would be pretty bad because then we're not blocking any light. So we've got a lot of background noise. But if actuators fail, there are redundancies. If a telescope mirror gets um, uh, bent out of shape, not bent out of shape, if an actuator gets jammed and you can't just by sending software signals to it, signal software updates to it, if it gets jammed, um, you can still operate without those. You'll just lose a lot. You'll lose some of the light. You'll lose one eighteenth of the amount of light. So you'd have to increase the observing time by one eighteenth of the or eight, you know, six percent or something. Um, so you can sort of get around it. You don't want to deal with this, but if it if things go wrong, there are contingencies and you can still accomplish a lot of the work you do. You may do less of it, or you may not, you may do it with larger error bars because of the noise, but yeah. Speaking of workarounds, um, a lot of platforms are designed for, let's say a one plus one equals three instruments, kind of like if a third instrument can be synthesized from two other physical ones on board. Are there any of those type of um, synthesized instruments on, on web? Well, in principle, those four instruments, the, the four that I mentioned, those can all be synthesized in this way, I think, as the, the, what, he's, what he's getting at. You can do all of these um, in, in dual, mo dual mode. 
Um, there may be, I'm not sure about this, but it may be possible to use the fine guidance sensors as scientific instruments in conjunction with the um, near cam, near is set up or what have you. And what that would allow you to do is the fine guidance sensors just measures light. It's, it just measures positions accurately. So you would maybe be able to do some sort of um, high resolution study um, with the FGS that is not possible because of um, you know, uh, engineering constraints on the other instruments that you could do with, with, with that. But you couldn't point it at the same position, so you'd have to do it parallel and you wouldn't be able to do all one, one object. But in principle, every, op every instrument can be run one plus one. So you can synthesize a full baseline if you want for the MIRI plus the other, one of the other three instruments. Okay, and our last question of the evening for those of you who, do, who have stuck around the last uh, extra minutes, um, is the position of JWST dictated by conservation of energy required by the telescope to do its job? Uh, yeah, yeah. So it, that L2 point, um, this is a Astro 200 question we ask on a, the first quiz, I think. Um, calculate where these L2, L, L, Lagrange positions are. And in, in, those, in those calculations, what you'll see is that sort of like, you know, the analogy you always use is like a, a car going around the curve. When that car goes around the curve, you feel your body sort of pulled out towards the, in the direction of the, or opposite to the direction of the curve. Uh, so there's this, you feel this centrifugal force, which is a restoring force to the centripetal force that draws you inward. In those positions, the force of gravity is balancing out that. So it's, a, it's not really conservation of, well, you have to take into energy, um, but it's, it's, um, a it's a force conservation. Um, it's a fairly straightforward dynamics problem. Um, and we take advantage of that to, to keep JWST in position without having to constantly adjust. Now it doesn't actually sit there at L2, it orbits around it, but you're orbiting around a point of equipotential. So you stay there. Okay. Well, thank you again for joining us this evening. We got through all the questions. Okay. And those of you who stuck around, thank you for sticking around. Sorry, I put too much in. I get got carried away. But it's an exciting topic. It's easy to get carried away. I hope I hope that everyone learned walked away with something. But, yes. All right. Sounds okay. good. All right. Thanks so much for inviting me. I'll talk to you guys uh, in the future when I'm up there. I still haven't been to the new bell. So well, we encourage you to come by anytime. I will. I will. Absolutely. Okay. See you guys. Have, have a good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.